138 filibusters eating up all the floor time, preventing modest amendments, preventing modest bills, and putting us on this path to gridlock. The Senate is broken. Let's fix it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Senator from Tennessee. Madam President. Senator from Excuse Tennessee. I have, uh, I have enjoyed this extensive opportunity to, to hear my colleagues on a very important subject, um, what the nature of the Senate will be. I'm, I'm going to have about 10 minutes of, of, of remarks uh, to comment on Senator Merkley and Senator Udall's comments, and then I'm going to yield to Senator, uh, the Senator from Oregon, other, other Senator from Oregon, Senator Wyden, and for, for, for his colloquy. Um, <clears throat> Madam President, if, if I could say anything <clears throat> uh, that, uh, you know, from, from deep down within me to my colleagues who are so exercised about this, it would be this. Before we change the rules, use the rules. Before we change the rules, use the rules. Now, we've, we've talked about Senator Byrd a lot because he, he understood the rules so well. I've often told the story of when Senator Baker became the Republican leader, the majority leader in 1981. He went to see Senator Byrd, the Democratic leader, and said, Senator Byrd, I'm suddenly the majority leader. I'll never know the rules as well as you do. So I'll make a deal with you. <clears throat> if you won't surprise me, I won't surprise you. And Senator Byrd said, let me think about it. <laughs> and the next morning, he told Senator Baker he, he, would, he would do that. And the reason I mentioned those two senators is because before we get too mired down in our differences, let's think for a moment about what the goal ought to be. And the goal to me for the Senate is the Senate the way it operated during those eight years when Senator Byrd and Senator Baker were the leaders of their party? Four years, Byrd was majority leader. Four years, Baker was majority leader. And in talking to staff members, some of whom were still around, uh, you know, Senator Merkley has, goes back to Senator Hatfield in 1976. I first came here in 1967 as Senator Baker's legislative assistant when there were only one legislative assistant per senator. But by the time it got to 77, I actually came up and spent three months here with Senator Baker when he became the Republican leader. And I followed it pretty closely during, during, during the next eight years. Here's the way it worked. The majority leader, whether it was Byrd or Baker, would bring a bill to the floor. He would get the bill to the floor because the senators knew they were going to get to debate and amend the bill. The senator from Oregon's talking about no debates? Well, of course there's no debates because when we come down here with an amendment, the majority leader doesn't let us offer it. All those cloches he's talking about means the majority leader is cutting off my right to represent my people and offer an amendment and a debate. They're calling a filibuster a cutoff. <laughs> it wouldn't be a filibuster if the majority leader weren't cutting off my right to debate, which he's done six times, which he's done more than the last six majority leaders put together. But let's go back to what the goal ought to be. So Senator Byrd or Senator Baker would say, okay, the education bill is up, energy bill is up, everybody get their amendments in. They might get 300 amendments. Then at some point, the majority leader would say, I ask for unanimous consent that the amendments be cut off. Well, of course, they'd get that after a while because everybody had all the amendments in they could think of. So they, they might have 300 amendments. That was not unusual. 300 amendments. You didn't go over to the majority leader and say, oh, get down on your knee and say, Mr. Majority Leader, may I please offer an amendment? May I offer this amendment? May I offer that amendment? You just put your amendment in there. And then they started voting. And then they did something else that we don't do today, which is why I'm talking about using the rules before we change the rules. They voted. They debated. They voted. They debated. They voted. They debated. And of course, 300 amendments is a lot of amendments. And so the leaders and the staff would say uh, to the senator from North Carolina or the senator from Oregon, are you sure you want 25 amendments? It's Wednesday night. No, uh, 10 will be enough. Then you get to Thursday night. Are you sure you want these five amendments? It's Thursday night. We're going to be here Friday. And we're going to finish this bill. We'll be here Saturday if we have to be. We'll be here Sunday. Now, you're going to get your amendment. 
and we're going to vote on it, but we're going to finish the bill. That's what they did. That's what they did. Now, it wasn't always that case. I mean, sometimes there'd be a, a, a legislation that would come up that one side or the other wanted to kill, so they'd try to kill it. I mean, just like we would today. If the Democrats bring up, abolish the secret ballot in union elections, we'll do everything we can to kill it. If we, if the House passes a bill to bring it over here to uh, re repeal the health care law, why, the Democrats are going to do everything they can to kill it. That's, that's separate. But most of the time, the bill came to the floor, there was bipartisan cooperation, there were amendments. Now, why was there bipartisan cooperation? Because they knew that unless they had it, they wouldn't move an inch. And being good senators, they wanted to do their jobs. In fact, Senator Baker would tell his Republican chairman, don't even bring the bill to the floor unless the ranking member, the Democrat, is with you. That, so the, the picture would be most of the time that you'd have the Democrat and the Republican there and amendments, and they'd be fighting amendments off, and, and they'd get to a conclusion. That, that was how it usually, usually worked. And there weren't so many filibusters because the majority leader wasn't cutting off the right to debate and calling it a filibuster. I mean, this is a word trick is what this is. So that's my concern. I, I think most of us, I've talked to a lot of my friends on the Democratic side, a lot of Republicans, I think we basically want the same thing. I think we want a Senate that works better. I think it's a mere shadow of itself. I agree with Senator Merkley about that. But not because of filibusters, it's because the majority leader is cutting off debate and calling it a filibuster. So the majority leader and the Republican leader I commend today because they have been talking about how, how we can do better. And we all know that, that changing the behavior will be more lasting than changing the rules. I'm glad Senator Reed and Senator McConnell are working on this. And they've asked Senator Schumer and me to, to, to work on it some more. We're, and we're going to do that. We're, we have been. We've had several meetings. We've got another one this afternoon. Uh, we'll, we'll keep working, and, and we'll consider carefully these proposals or any others that come, and we'll see if we can come to some agreement about how to move ahead. But my heartfelt plea is, before we change the rules, let's use the rules. Uh, going down through the, the suggestions, for example, the motion to proceed, that's a difficult one for many of us because if you're in the minority, the motion to proceed is your weapon to require the majority to give you amendments. Secret ballots. Senator Wyden tells me he and Senator Grassley have been working on that for 15 years. Secret holds, I mean. Well, they have Republican support and Democrat support for that. Maybe this is the time to deal with that. I, I have, I make my holds public. Um, when I was nominated for United States Education Secretary and by President Bush the first. The senator from Ohio held me up for three months, never saying why, and I went around to see the senator from New Hampshire and asked him what to do. That was Senator Rudman. He said when he was nominated by President Ford to the Federal Communications Commission, the senator from New Hampshire held him up. And uh, finally, Rudman withdrew his name and ran against the senator and beat him. That's how he got in the Senate. So there are various cures for this problem. But secret holes, and you'll be talking more about that, is an area that's had a lot of work and has bipartisan support. The right to offer amendments. The problem I have with that is that's what we do. I went out to see Johnny Cash one time in the 1980s, and I asked him a dumb question. I said, well, Johnny, how many nights are you on the road? He said, oh, 200. And I said, why do you do that? He said, that's what I do. Well, I mean, if you're on the Grand Ole Opry, you sing. If you're in the Senate, you offer amendments. You, offer de you debate. That's what we do. That's what we're supposed to do, yet we haven't been allowed to do it. Uh, talking filibusters. If, if we talk about the post-cloture period, the problem with that is the majority has not used the rules. If I hold up, if I object to going forward with a bill, the majority, if they think I'm abusing that, they can say, okay, Senator Alexander, get down there on the floor because we're going to be here all night and you can only get seven hours, then you've got to line up 23 other senators to take one hour each and if you stop talking, we're going to put the question. And if you do a number of things, we're going to make a dilatory motion. In other words, the majority can make it really hard for a senator who, who objects. And someone said one, two, or three, or four senators can hold this place up. They cannot hold it up. They cannot. 
Because if you have 60 votes, you can pass anything. If you have 60 votes, you can pass anything. And Senator Byrd said in his last testimony before the Rules Committee that you can confront a filibuster by using the rules. Now, the last two things we could do is, one, we could stop complaining about voting. I mean, it happens on the Republican side and the Democratic side. I mean, if somebody offers an amendment that's controversial and everybody runs up to the leader and says, oh, we don't want to vote on that. Well, we're here to vote. That's why we're here. So we should do that. And the third thing we can do, and Senator Byrd suggested this in his last testimony, is let's get rid of the three-day three work week. There is not enough time for all the senators to offer their amendments, and there is not enough time for the majority to confront the minority if they think the filibuster is being abused if we have a three-day work week and we never vote on Friday and we didn't vote on Friday one time this year. So let's use the rules. Let's use the rules. If you think we're holding something up improperly, confront that senator. Run over him. You can do it. You've got the power to do it if you have 60 votes. And in this new Congress, um, there will be plenty of opportunities. There. Finally, uh, I'm going to take these five suggestions and and, and, and work with Senator Schumer and work with my friends on the other side. They're very thoughtful. Senator Udall spent a lot of time on this. Senator Wyden and Grassley spent 15 years. Senator Merkley used to be a speaker. and He's talked to me. We've talked a number of times. I greatly respect his work in his state and the fact that he has seen the Senate for a long period of time. I'm taking very seriously every, everything that's said here. I'm just, I'm just worried about turning the Senate in the House. We've got a majoritarian organization over there. They can repeal the health care law or they can get rid of the secret ballot and union elections. And if you turn this place into that, then you'll just go bam, bam, and it's done. What the Senate is for is to say, whoa, whoa. Let's, uh, let's see if we can get a consensus before we do anything. And when we get a consensus, we not only get a better bill, usually, the country accepts it better. They like to see us cooperating. They like to see us coming up with a tax bill or a treaty or whatever, a civil rights bill or a health care bill or a financial regulation bill where we've all got something in it. They feel better about that. It's the check and the balance that's the genius of our system. So obviously we can do some things better around here. I'm committed to trying. I thank my friends for the amount of time and effort they've given. I'm going to take everything they've said very seriously and in the spirit that they've offered it. But uh, I hope a part of our solution is that we, we use the rules before we change the rules, because this is the form to protect minority rights. This is the form to force a consensus, and we dare not lose that. Uh, we dare not lose that. I thank uh, the President. I yield the floor. The Senator from Oregon. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of the bipartisan Wyden, Grassley, McCaskill, Collins resolution to end secret holds, which is at the desk. Is there objection? Uh, Madam President, reserving the right to object. Uh, as I said earlier, Senator Wyden and Senator Grassley, Senator McCaskill and others have worked on this, some of them for as long as 15 years. They've made significant progress in gaining bipartisan support. I'm going to object, but only for the reason that uh, this is one of the items that we'll be discussing and working on over the next few weeks with the hope that perhaps we can get agree agreement over here and agreement over there. It's been mentioned by all of the speakers today. And uh, uh, it's a very serious proposal. But because we don't want to resolve it today, I object. Madam President. Objection having been heard. Madam, Madam President. The, the resolution will go over under the rule. The senator from Oregon. Ma Madam President, before he leaves the floor, let me thank uh, Senator Alexander for the discussions that he has had with me on this uh, issue also. Uh, Senator McConnell has spoken with me uh, about this. I wish we were getting this done today, largely because this would give us a chance on the first day of the United States Senate uh, new uh, session to send a message that once and for all we were deep-sixing secrecy. 
that we were saying that public business ought to be done in public. I wish it was being done today, but I understand completely uh, the sentiments of uh, the senator from Tennessee and the fact that he is willing to work with me is something that I appreciate. Madam President, as I've indicated, there are obviously significant differences between the parties about how to reform the rules of the United States uh, Senate. What I hope will be done, certainly the very first day that the Senate uh, comes back and is in a position to formally act, which appears to be January 24th, is once and for all we could bring Democrats and Republicans together around an extraordinarily important change in the Senate rules that Senator Grassley and I have been trying to end for literally 15 years, and now particularly with the energy and the enthusiasm that Senator McCaskill has brought uh, to the cause, I think we are now on the cusp of being able to finally get this done. Madam President, it's been clear that if you walk up and down the main streets uh, of this country, people don't know what a secret hold is. Probably a lot of people think it's a hairspray. And the fact of the matter is there are more versions of secret holds than there are moves in pro wrestling. But what a secret hold really is all about, it is one of the most extraordinary powers that an individual senator has here in the United States Senate, and it can be exercised, Madam President, without any transparency and without any accountability whatsoever. What a secret hold is all about is one United States Senator can block the American people, the entire country, from learning about a piece of legislation that can involve billions of dollars, scores and scores of people, or a nomination with the ability to influence the lives of all Americans, one United States Senator can block that consideration without owning up to the fact that they are the one that is defying the public's right to know about how Senate business is being blocked. Madam President, that's just wrong. It's not about how Republicans see it or Democrats see it. It's just common sense. Most people, when you tell them that a United States Senator can block an enormously important piece of legislation or a nomination that affects millions of people, they can do it in secret, they say, I can't believe that you all have those kinds of rules. Well, the fact is, that is the way the Senate operates, Madam President. And suffice it to say, it's getting worse. Just a few days ago, for example, Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, said that the number of vacancies on our courts is cre creating a judicial emergency. Now, those are the words of Justice Roberts. At least 19 federal judges have been approved by the Senate Judiciary Committee unanimously or near unanimously, and never got a vote on the floor of the United States Senate. Madam President, not one United States Senator has publicly taken responsibility for worsening the judicial crisis that Justice Roberts has been decrying over the last few days. Just think about that. The Chief Justice of the United States during the Christmas holiday, said there was one thing he was concerned about, and that was the emergency in the judicial system. Justice Roberts, in my view, is correct. I think we do have an emergency. We've been trying to get several judges in the state of Oregon approved, Senator Merkley and I, but no member of the United States uh, Senate will publicly take responsibility for worsening this crisis that Justice Roberts is appropriately so concerned about. Now, we have tried in the past, Madam President, with legislation. We actually got a law passed at one time 
to get rid of secret holds. We have tried with pledges from the leadership of both political parties, and in every instance, the defenders of secrecy have found their way around the requirements and, in my view, the public interest. I would just make two points, and then I want to allow Senator McCaskill to have a chance to address this uh, issue. But there are two points with respect to why this effort, Madam President, to end secret holds would be different. The first is that every hold here in the United States Senate after the passage of this bipartisan resolution would have a public owner. Every single hold would have a public uh, owner. And second, there would be consequences. In the past, there have not been consequences for the individual who would object. In fact, the individual who would object would usually send someone else out to do their objecting for them, and there would be complete anonymity for essentially all concerned, because the person who would be objecting would be, in effect, saying, this isn't my doing, I'm just doing it for somebody else. So the heart of this bipartisan you know, compromise is to make sure that every hold has a public owner and there would be consequences. There may be, Madam President, there may be a senator around here who becomes known as Senator Obstruction. Senator Obstruction is the one who's trying to block public business. Let them explain it to the American people. So I'll have more to say about it uh, in a little bit and the possibility of other colleagues uh, coming, but Senator McCaskill has really brought the kind of energy and passion to this that has made it possible for us to as I say, be on the cusp of finally forcing here in the Senate public business to be done in public. I want to thank her for all her help, allow her to take the uh, time. She said she thought she might speak for around 10 minutes. Senator Klobuchar, who has also been a great and passionate advocate of open government, uh, will also speak. And for colleagues that have an interest, uh, we have 30 minutes uh, of time and death. Uh, Senator McCaskill, with appreciation for all you have, uh, have done, uh, uh, the time is yours. M M Madam President. The Senator from Missouri. Madam President, when I arrived um, in this chamber four years ago at this time, I had no idea what the ways of the Senate were. I had an idea that this is a place where people came to debate and to have a, a collegial relationship with your fellow senators across the aisle. And there had been a lot of problems with ethical issues in the Capitol. And so one of the first things that happened for the class of 2006 was Senate Bill 1. And Senate Bill 1 was a far-reaching ethics bill that included things like no more free flights on corporate jets, um, it included uh, new requirements on, in terms of gifts from lobbyists, and it also included a provision that I didn't know at the time uh, was, uh, had been worked on by Senator Wyden and Senator Grassley for many, many years. Um, that provision said that we weren't going to have secret holes anymore. So imagine how great I felt on January 18, 2007 that we had done this comprehensive ethics bill that was going to clean up our act and that we weren't going to have secret holds. Well, I find it ironic that Senator Alexander says, well, just use the rules. Just use them. Well, so when I started figuring out that the game around here in the last 18 months had developed into a game of secret holds, I asked my staff, I said, hey, didn't we have something in Senate Bill 1 about secret holds? not knowing really the relationship that language had to Senator Wyden and Senator Grassley. So my staff pulls out the legislation, we look at it, and I go, well, right here it says they can't do it. So I began coming down to the floor and using the law. I did exactly what Senator Alexander recommended. I came down here and began making motion after motion which under the language of that statute would seem to indicate that all the senators supported, except for a handful, 
that once you made these motions, that people would have to come out of the shadows and claim their holds. Well, that's when I discovered that the people who voted for this, there were a bunch of them that didn't mean it. They didn't mean it. It was window dressing. They weren't sincere about ending secret holds because we discovered when we started trying to use that language that some of the folks who voted for it were doing the old switcheroo. When they were called upon under the law to reveal their hold, they would just hand their hold off to someone else. And that's when I began getting frustrated with the games that were being played. And I want to thank Senator Wyden and Senator Grassley and others that have worked on this. But I'll tell you what's the most depressing thing I've heard here today. That this is something that's been worked on for 15 years. Now, seriously, think about that. We have allowed people to secretly hold nominations and the people's business, and there have been members trying to clean it up for 15 years. And we wonder why we're having trouble with our approval ratings. Nothing is more hypocritical than all the sanctimonious stuff I'm hearing down the hall about the new era. No more business as usual. No more, uh, we're going to have accountability and transparency. But yet, we seem to be embroiled down on this end of the hall with not even being able to get beyond a secret hold. This shouldn't be hard. This should be easy. Now, some of the other provisions that are being debated today, I understand that there is, there's concern about the power of the minority in the United States Senate. I think those concerns have been addressed in the resolution that's been presented by Senators Merkley and Senators Udall and, and Senator uh, Harkin from Iowa. Uh, but really, if we can't get 67 votes to end secret holds, and amend the rules, how seriously can we take anybody that claims they want accountability and transparency in government? I mean, this is the Hall of Fame of hypocrisy. This isn't just hypocrisy. It's the Hall of Fame. So that's why I think we've got to get busy and get the secret hold uh, provision done. I would like to see us get all of these reforms done. And I, I really want to just spend a second uh, on... on what Senator Alexander's suggestion was. His suggestion was to use the rules. Well, honestly, does he think the way to solve this problem is to force the majority to stay here all night with staff, spending the taxpayers' money to force someone over and over again to say, I object? Because we can't make the minority talk. So that means the majority whether it's Democrats or Republicans, have to stay all night and call the question. They don't have to have, I mean, we could do live quorum calls, but really that's what, that's what we need to do to make this place work. That's his suggestion, that, that to, to force the people who are objecting and the staff and, and, and the people around here to stay here all night, every night, uh, until someone breaks, that's a good idea. I think that means that somebody's probably been around here too long. Doesn't sound like a good idea. That's not a common sense idea that we'd be promoting in Main Street of Missouri. I think it makes more sense that if you're the minority and you want to block legislation, that you own it. Just own it. Block it. That's what the Senate's about. Minority can continue to block legislation, whether the Democrats are in the minority or the Republicans are in the minority. They can block all the legislation they want. They just got to own it. They just got to be willing to say, we are blocking this for the following reasons because we think it's important and let the people decide. Same thing with hold. You want to hold something, hold it. But let the people decide whether or not you're being reasonable. Or whether you're really, what I was disgusted to learn is how many people were using secret holds. In fact, they brag about it. They were using secret holds to get something else. I'm going to hold this nominee in this department because I want money for a community center in my town. If you don't give me money for a community center in my town, you can't get the Deputy Secretary of the Interior through. I mean, I'm making up this example, but that's, that's actually what's going on. It's like you secretly hold something so that you can get them to give you something else. Now, that's the essence of the backroom dealing that 
people are disgusted with. Own it. Be proud of it. Defend it. Debate it. Uh, but don't hide it. And that's what this is all about. I want to thank all my colleagues who have worked on this. And I just want to close with this comment. Bad habits have consequences. And if we don't take this opportunity to fix what's going on in the Senate, this is not the way the Senate has operated for hundreds of years. If we don't change this path, then we're going to be on this path forever. And if the minority now doesn't think that when the time comes that they may not be in the minority anymore, if they don't think we haven't learned from them, seriously, this place is going to be dysfunctional as far as the eye can see because they'll fill the tree and we'll just block everything and then they'll block everything and we'll fill the tree and this is going to go on forever until there are enough people around here that are willing to set aside the political maneuvering and do what's right for the future of deliberations in a body that we all want to be proud of. But right now, we can't be so proud of the way we operate around here. So I want to thank uh, the senator from Oregon and, and all the senators who have worked on this, and I hope that um, we, can, we can pull back from the brink, because that's where we are. We're about ready to institutionalize a way of operating around here that isn't something that any of us should be proud of. And I yield the floor. Madam, Madam President. The senator from Oregon. How, how much time left do we have on our... 13 minutes. Thank you, Madam President. I yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from uh, Minnesota. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for le your leadership, Senator White and Madam President. The senator as, from Minnesota. As we begin the 112th Congress, I want to first congratulate my colleagues on how we ended the 111th Congress. We had an incredibly productive lame duck session. Uh, ensuring that taxes weren't raised on the middle class during an economic downturn, ratifying uh, the START Treaty, among other things. We worked together to solve problems. This was not always the case during the last Congress, but we ended on a high note. But as our work begins today anew, we all know there is still a great deal of work to be done, Madam President. We have a lot of work ahead of us to ensure that American workers can find jobs, to get our private sector economy back on track to find long-term solutions to our mounting deficit. Because of the urgent business that is in front of us, I am hopeful that my fellow senators and my colleagues across the aisle will agree uh, that it is time for some change, that it is not time for business as usual. And we have heard from so many of my colleagues uh, that have been working on this issue, Senator Udall, Senator Merkley, Senator Harkin, Senator Wyden, Senator McCaskill, and also Senator Grassley with his important work on the secret hold. The elections on November 2nd sent a message to every member of Congress. The American people aren't interested in partisan bickering or procedural backlogs or the gamemanship and gridlock that prevent elected officials from doing their jobs. We weren't hired by our constituents Madam President, to hide behind outdated Senate rules as an excuse for not accomplishing things or not taking tough votes. That's just what the current Senate rules are allowing us to do. Now, I heard a lot from my uh, friend from Tennessee about how we want to use, we should use the current rules. Well, the problem I have is that too many people have been abusing the current rules. First, as Senator Wyden, Senator McCaskill, Senator Grassley so eloquently stated, we have to permanently end the practice known as secret hold, which basically allows one or two members of the Senate to prevent nominations or legislation from reaching the Senate floor without identifying themselves. We thought we had this done, as Senator McCaskill pointed out, with the ethics bill that we passed when we first came into this chamber, uh, but unfortunately, once again, those world rules were abused. There are some senators who are playing games with the rules. They're following the letter, but not the spirit of the reforms we adopted. Look at the kind of secret holds we've seen. Secret holds uh, preventing the president from assembling the team he needs to run the executive branch. This summer, for example, secret holds were placed on two members of the Marine Mammal Commission for months. The Marine Mammal Commission held secret in a hold while the deep water oil horizon spill was continuing to play out in the Gulf region. A second example 
of what we have to get done here is filibuster reform. It is a long-standing tradition in the Senate that one senator can, if she chooses, hold the floor to explain her objections to a bill. We think of Jimmy Stewart's character, Jefferson Smith, and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington as a shining example of how individual conscience can matter, because an individual can stay on the Senate floor to the point of exhaustion in order to stymie a corrupt piece of legislation. Well, that is not how the filibuster works in practice today. Today, an individual senator virtually has the power to prevent legislation from being considered by merely threatening a filibuster. At that point, the majority leader must file a cloture petition in order to move to that piece of legislation. This adds a great deal of time to an already crowded Senate calendar. This is not governing. This is not how we do the people's business. This is not how we come together to find practical solutions to our common problems. Our current system is a far cry from Jimmy Stewart. That is why a group of us have been working to get some legislation passed to change the rules going forward. When you think about the history of this Senate, and I listen with uh, great respect as my colleagues talk about the tradition of the importance of the rules of the Senate, about protecting the rights of the minority, none of these proposals, none of these proposals will interfere with the rights of the minority to filibuster any piece of legislation. But when you look at that history of the Senate, it is about tradition. But as time goes forward, there have been changes to the Senate rules. Every few decades, there are changes to the Senate rules. You look at my former colleague, Vice President Mondale, a great leader who made significant changes to the Senate rules. The Mr. Senator. President, this is all about transparency and accountability, and I urge my colleagues to support this resolution. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Oregon. President, I don't see any other colleagues that want to speak on the bipartisan effort to end a secret hold. So let me just make a couple of comments here in, in wrapping up. The first is Senator Grassley and I and others who have been at this for so long have been willing in the past to just put a statement in the congressional record when in the it was important to block a particular piece of legislation or, or a nomination, we felt it was important to be publicly accountable. All we are asking, Mr. President, is that principle of openness, transparency, and government in the sunshine apply to all members of the United States Senate. The fact is, Mr. President, secrecy has real consequences. I mentioned the fact that Chief Justice Roberts has been so concerned about the judicial emer emergencies that he has seen develop in our court system. I will tell colleagues that I saw during the lame duck uh, session on a bipartisan bill that Senator Cornyn and I spent many, many months on to combat sex trafficking, we saw the consequences of a secret hold when the bill passed the United States Senate, went over to the House of Representatives, was passed in the House, and then came back here to the United States uh, Senate, and it was blocked secretly. A bipartisan bill, Mr. President, to allow us to strengthen the tools that law enforcement would have in order to fight sex trafficking, to provide urgently needed shelters to sex trafficking victims, a bipartisan bill that Senator Cornyn and I spent many, many months on did not become law during the lame duck session because of a secret uh, hold. So I think a lot of senators have seen exactly these kinds of problems. Judges, U.S. attorney uh, candidates, we had both from my home state, two judges that couldn't be considered because of a hold with our being in a position to not identify who was objecting. Same with the uh, U.S. Uh, attorney. These are the real consequences 
Mr. President, of secret holds. And I want to close with one last point, and that is the big winners, it seems to me, in these secret holds are the lobbyists. The lobbyists benefit tremendously from secret holds. Practically every senator has gotten a request from a lobbyist asking if the senator would put a secret hold on a bill or a nomination in order to kill it without getting any public debate and without the lobbyist's fingerprints appearing anywhere. If you can get a U.S. senator to go out and put an anonymous hold on a bill, you've then hit the lobbyist jackpot. No lobbyist can win more significantly than by getting a senator to secretly object because the senator is protected by the cloak of anonymity, but so is the lobbyist. And with a secret hold, lobbyists can then go play both sides of the street. They can give lobbyists a victory for their clients without alienating potential or future clients. Given the number of instances where I've heard of lobbyists asking for secret holds, I want to say that those uh, who oppose our efforts to end secret holds are basically saying that we ought to give lobbyists an extra tool, an extension of the tools they already uh, have in order to advocate for their clients and defy public accountability. We pass stricter ethics requirements with respect to lobbyists. just looks to me to be the height of hypocrisy if the Senate adopts a variety of changes to curtail lobbying, as has been done in the past, at the same time allowed lobbyists to continue to benefit, as so many of these special interests have, from secret holds. So this is the opportunity, Mr. President, after a decade and a half for the public to get a fair shake and for the public interest to come first. We have tried this in the past with laws. We've tried this in the past with pledges. But I think that the public has caught on. Suffice it to say, there are going to be plenty of differences between Democrats and Republicans with respect to how to reform the rules of the United States Senate. What I think has come to light is it doesn't pass the smell test to keep arguing that Senate business ought to be done in secret. The American people don't buy that anymore. They think this ought to be an open institution, a place where every senator is held accountable. This time is going to be different. There are going to be uh, owners, public owners of any uh, hold. There are going to be consequences for any senator who tries to block a bill or a nomination in secret. It's going to be an important vote when we come back, Mr. President, a very important vote, and finally one that will require that public business here in the United States Senate be done in public. Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Washington. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Pre President, I ask unanimous consent to speak as of in morning business for seven minutes. Right now. Without objection. Mr. President, I rise this afternoon to recognize and congratulate my good friend from Maryland, Senator Barbara Mikulski, on today becoming the longest serving female senator in the history of the Senate. This is an achievement that takes courage and passion and commitment three things that all of us who know her so well know that she has in abundance. But Mr. President, even more important than honoring my friend on the length of her service, today I think it's important to recognize what she has done with that service. The senior senator from Maryland over her 24 years in the Senate has established herself as a trailblazer, a legislator, a leader, and above all, a fighter for her people in her state. But to me and to all the other women senators who followed in her footsteps, she's simply a mentor. She's the senator who's offered us guidance, taught us to be fearless, and who has set a standard for all women senators who follow. Mr. President, from the first time I ever spoke to Senator Mikulski, one thing was clear. She didn't run for the Senate to be one woman senator. She ran to be one of many. 
I first came to the Senate in 1992 in the so-called Year of the Woman, and I can remember a lot of the press that year being about how our incoming class of four women senators would open the door to changes in the culture of the Senate. But when I got here, I quickly realized that door had not only already been opened, it had been broken down by Senator Mikulski. She was the first female Democrat to serve on the Senate Appropriations Committee. And she was also the very first one to take all of the new women senators under her wing. Senator Mikulski realized back then there was no rule book for women in the Senate, so she took it upon herself to help us guide the way. She drew on her own experiences to make the transition for all of us easier. She organized seminars, taught us about working together, taught us about the legislative process and the rules on the floor and the many more subtle rules off the floor. In short, she showed us the ropes, and she has been doing it ever since. But her work doesn't end with helping women senators get their foot in the door. I don't know if it's because she was a social worker before she came to Washington, but one thing Senator Mikulski knows is that relationships matter, and that's why she has worked to make sure that once women senators get here, we are working together on both sides of the aisle. It's why she bring, brings Republican and Democratic women together for dinner so we can find common ground and help solve problems. Because while Senator Mikulski knows it's important and courageous to be the first, she also understands the first ones have to be responsible and successful so that others can and will follow. It's because she has done her job so well that other women have been able to follow in her footsteps and she has done her job well. Mr. President, Senator Mikulski is here today as the longest serving woman senator, not by accident or by happenstance. She is here because she earned it, because the people of her state know she is an indispensable champion for their causes, because she works across party lines, because she delivers results, and because as she has said to us so many times, she's always ready to square her shoulders, put on her lipstick, and suit up for the people who need it most. Whether it's leading the fight for the very first bill President Obama signed into law that guarantees women cannot be paid less than men for doing the same job, or fighting for seniors that rely on Social Security, or delivering investments for firefighters or police officers and first responders, or standing up for all those in Maryland who depend on her state's environmental resources for their livelihood. There are few others that I want in my corner like her, and there are few others who work as hard as she does to give a voice to those who wouldn't otherwise have it. Mr. President, since Senator Mikulski was elected back in 1986, she has helped guide the way for 22 more women senators. Today, there are 17. But she will also be the first one to tell you we're not yet where we need to be, that more women need to serve in this body. And that's why she has built a team of women senators behind her that continues to grow. Every generation, every election, every year. Today, Senator McCulsey makes history by serving longer than any other woman. But I know that many years from now, when women have achieved a larger, more representative body than, than we now have, Senator Mikulski will be at the very top of the list of people to thank. The person who not only cut the path, but who went back and guided so many of us down it. And thanks to her, one day, the remarkable accomplishment we are celebrating today may no longer be such a remarkable thing for a woman to achieve. It will be commonplace, and that will be her true and lasting legacy. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from North Carolina. I am honored to join my colleagues on the Senate floor today in honoring my mentor and dear friend, Senator Barbara Mikulski, on becoming the longest serving woman in the history of the United States Senate. For more than 24 trailblazing years, Senator Mikulski has been one of the Senate's fiercest advocates for women, families, and for the people of Maryland who have now elected her to the Senate for five consecutive terms.
Before she arrived in Washington in 1977 as the representative for the 3rd District of Maryland, Senator Mikulski already had a distinguished career in public service, working in Baltimore as a social worker, then a community activist, and as a city council member. When she was first sworn in as a woman of the House of Representatives, as a member of the House, she was one of just 18 female members. When she entered the Senate 10 years later as the first Democratic woman senator elected in her own right, she was one of just two women in this upper chamber. But while those numbers have intimidated most, they only motivated and emboldened Senator Mikulski. She soon impressed her colleagues as she continues to do today with her work ethic, determination, keen understanding of issues, humor, and her commitment to her constituents. She has broken many barriers in her career. She was the first woman ever elected statewide in Maryland, the first to chair an appropriations subcommittee, and the first woman to serve in the Democratic leadership. If we are no longer surprised today when we see women in power in Washington, it is only because we had pioneers like Barbara Mikulski. As she recently told CNN, I might be the first, but I don't want to be the last. There are now 17 women serving in the U.S. Senate, and Senator Mikulski, the Dean of the Women, is our leader and our champion. I was both humbled and honored to have her escort me when I was sworn in as a United States Senator two years ago. That was just the beginning of her ongoing mentorship. Although the Senate can often be bogged down by partisanship, I appreciate that Senator Mikulski encourages and creates an environment of teamwork, respect, and friendship. But while we today mark her place in history as a woman senator, she is widely regarded as one of the most respected, accomplished, and effective public servants in all of Congress. To use Senator Mikulski's own words, she showed it's not about gender, it's about agenda. She is one of the Senate's strongest advocates for science and technology and the importance of investing in innovation to spur our economy. In fact, earlier this year, I was watching a 3D movie about the Hubble telescope at the Smithsonian with my daughter, a scientist, and there was Senator Mikulski featured in the movie for her role preserving the telescope's budget, a feat she calls one of her proudest accomplishments. She also wrote the Spousal Anti-Impoverishment Act, which protects seniors across our country from going bankrupt while paying for a spouse's nursing home care. She shepherded through the Lilly Ledbetter Act, which helps to ensure that no matter your gender, your race, your natural origin, religion, age, or disability, you will receive equal pay for equal work. And she fought tenaciously for her important amendment to health care reform legislation, ensuring that a comprehensive list of women's preventive services, such as screenings for breast and cervical cancer, would be covered with no added out-of-pocket expenses. I thank Senator Mikulski for her mentorship, her leadership, and her fierce belief in the empowerment of women in our communities and in public office. I congratulate her on this tremendous accomplishment, and I join my colleagues in looking forward to many more years of her distinguished service. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Mr. President, President, I notice the uh, I ask the uh, notice the absence of a quorum. Or the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
The uh, Senator from New Mexico. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, and, and uh, uh, good to be back with you. And, and the Senate is in a quorum call, Senator. I ask unanimous consent to officiate the quorum. Without call. objection. The, the um, process we're in right now, and we've had questions back and forth on this whole uh, issue of Senate rules reform. Uh, and I want to respond to Senator Alexander, because Senator Alexander raised some questions, and some of those questions were not answered uh, on our side, and so I want to put in a couple of responses here. And he, the big question that he answered, Senator Alexander, he asked the question, what is a filibuster? He was asking our side, he was in this debate, what is a filibuster? Well, all of us know, and we've heard in this debate, uh, what, a, what a true filibuster is. Uh, we really saw a hero here uh, on our side in terms of a true filibuster when it came to Bernie Sanders uh, just a week or so ago where he stood up for eight hours uh, to oppose a tax package on principle. Uh, and he took the floor and he spoke and spoke passionately. Uh, the other example, I think, of a true Senator Harkin, a true filibuster, is, is the movie that the American public knows the best, is a Jimmy Stewart movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And Senator Merkley earlier, earlier had some charts on that, and he showed Mr. Smith on the floor, and surrounded by other senators, and he spoke until he collapsed. And then you have the old-time tales of the Southern Democrats when civil rights legislation was being pushed in the 50s and 60s, uh, when a, a, a number of what you'd say northern senators were pushing anti-lynching law, anti-lynching law because lynching was going on in the South, and so they were trying to say you can't do that. And southern senators would stand up, I think sometimes the, the record was in the range of 20 hours or 25 hours, completely exhausted, on the floor speaking. So that's what so that's what the American public thinks about a filibuster. Well, that isn't what we know. That isn't what's happening here, uh, and I, I because the, I've been here for two years, and the only real filibuster I saw was the Bernie Sanders filibuster. I asked one of the historians, I think, when was the last one, and they said, well, you go back to 1992 with Alphonse D'Amato, where I think he took 12 hours to talk about an issue in New York that he was passionate about. So. When, when Senator Alexander asks us, what is a filibuster, that's my description of what is a filibuster, but what I think the real question is, and I would like Senator Alexander, when he returns to, to answer this, is what impact has the threat of a filibuster had? What impact has the threat of a filibuster had? And so people are probably saying, well, what is the threat of a filibuster? What are we talking about when we say the threat of a filibuster? Well, actually, we've been talking about it all day. First of all, it's the secret holes. As, as our presiding officer knows who sits on the Judiciary Committee, they, they work very hard in the Judiciary Committee. They produce uh, a bipartisan result on these judicial nominations. The judicial nominations, they come out, they're put on the calendar, and then months and months and months later, uh, some of them get up for a vote. And I don't know about the exact number, but uh, my understanding, uh, we had to send back to the president a number of, of judicial nominations uh, that had received bipartisan support from the committee. We finished our business in, in December, and we sent those nominations back only to have to have the president send them back down again because it's a new Congress. We're going to have to have hearings all over again. I mean, this is the kind of situation that we're in. And so that's, that's one specific case uh, of a threat of a filibuster. Uh, and we have these all the time. The one of the ones that, that is the most remarkable to me, and I'm not going to pick out the senator or the exact committee, uh, but, but a number of us as senators uh, saw a, a piece of, or a stack of bills, a stack of legislation that had come out on a bipartisan basis out of one of our committees that was this thick, and it was legislation from two years, 
two years of that committee legislating in a bipartisan way and those Democrats and Republicans working together and doing the hard work, and one senator, one senator held up all of that legislation, this last Congress held it up completely. That is the threat of a filibuster. And you say, well, how did that happen? Well, what happens is the legislation comes out of committee and a senator who we don't even know, I mean, a lot of us suspect after uh, various things that have happened over time, but the senator comes down and says in a secret way to his leader, well, if you bring any of those bills to the floor, I'm going to filibuster. Well, that's what the threat of a filibuster is, but that's an agreement that none of us know about. So the threat of a filibuster is, is, has had an enormous impact on this institution. And, and, and let me describe a couple of the other things. I talked about judicial nominations, uh, executive nominations. Uh, I, I, I come from the era when um, my father was Secretary of Interior. I was a kid. I remember when he went into office and, and visiting, with a, uh, was visiting with him about that later, and he said to me, uh, I, I said, you know, we can't get executive people in place. You don't have your team. And he said, Tom, he says, I had my whole team in place the first two weeks. So you're talking Department of Interior the whole, the first two weeks. Well, I remember the Washington Post did an extensive study, first year of the Obama administration. So President, imagine, President Obama takes office. He goes through a year and he only had 55% of his executive nominations in place. So he only had 55% of his team. So those of us that believe in government, believe that government does good things out there, uh, find that appalling because we believe if you put uh, people in place, they'll be responsive uh, to citizens on the particular issues that those departments have. So that, that uh, is, is very, very important. Uh, I believe, uh, getting executive nominations in place. And so that's what the, the threat of a filibuster ends up doing. The other, uh, and I see my colleague uh, uh, from uh, Mississippi is here, and I don't know whether he's going to step in for Mr. Alexander and ask questions. We're in this questioning back and forth period. Senator Harkin may want to say something on the, the question issue too here. Uh, but, but what impact has the threat of a filibuster had? Well, we, we can hear the argument, friend. Senator Alexander, I think, has made this a number of times. Well, look at all the great things you've accomplished uh, in the lame duck, and look at all the great things you accomplished, uh, that you feel you accomplished in terms of health care, uh, the stimulus package, and, and financial reform. But the reality is, is, in order to accomplish those, in the constant filibuster we were in, we have basically destroyed our institution. Um, and as some of the more senior senators here have told me, uh, the Senate is kind of a shadow of itself. Uh, and what do I mean we've destroyed the institution? Well, it used to be that, that our big oversight function uh, was to look over the money bills for the government, the appropriations bills. Well, guess what? Last year, we didn't do a single appropriations bill on the floor of the United States Senate. Now, you don't have to go back very far when we used to bring all 12 of those bills to the floor and we'd have two or three days of lively debate. Every senator can put in amendments. Uh, senator Harkin knows because he's, the, he's one of the cardinals. He's the chairman of one of these uh, committees. And it's a very helpful process. One for the agency to know that all senators are overlooking that agency and for a person in Senator Harkin's position that's the chair of the committee to know what the concern of the entire body is. But we've given that up. We don't do that anymore. And it's because of the constant filibuster and the threat of filibuster. Um, so, so you have uh, that situation. I, and I, I would think my a uh, friend from Mississippi, the senator from Mississippi, would be very concerned about this one. Uh, we didn't do a budget last year. You know, the one way we can really impact, if you talk about fiscal responsibility and you talk about uh, keeping the government under control and guiding it in the right direction, the one thing you want to do is a budget. You want to pass a budget and set some outlines there. Well, 
We didn't do a budget last year because we were in a constant filibuster, threat of a filibuster. Uh, and the story goes on and on. And so, uh, Senator Harkin, we're in the question phase right now. Uh, I'm going to, to uh, yield the floor. I'm sure there's time still on the other side. Uh, but, but I think the question is not, as uh, Senator Alexander raised, what is a filibuster? The real question out there, that when Senator Alexander returns, is what impact has the threat of a filibuster had on this institution we love of the United States Senate? I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Iowa.